in introducing uh, folks on a dais, and I've done this before as a moderator in days gone by, pre-online computer days, um, you would all be sitting here with a paper program, and it would have two pages of a litany of what the um, speakers had done in their careers. And my job would be to just say one or two clever things, um, and then we'd move right into it. Um, but then was then and now is now. None of you is sitting with a biography of these gentlemen uh, in front of you. And it's important that you understand um, the biographies of these gentlemen. As I went through them, um, they really exemplify the experience and the intellect uh, of today's general and flag officers. Admiral Michel is the Coast Guard Deputy Commandant for Operations. He's responsible for establishing and providing operational strategy, policy, guidance, and resources to meet the national priorities for U.S. Coast Guard missions, programs, and services. His previous flag officer assignments included Deputy Commander, U.S. Coast Guard Atlantic Area. So that's half the Coast Guard operationally. Director Joint Interagency Task Force South, GIATF South, um, probably the premier in the world combined joint interagency, uh, whole of government, whole of many governments um, element that there is. And, and he ran it, a very demanding job. Military advisor to the Secretary of Homeland Security. So advisor to a cabinet level official directly and director for governmental and public affairs of the Coast Guard. He's a graduate of the Coast Guard Academy with a degree in marine engineering with high honors. And he graduated summa cum laude from the University of Miami School of Law as the salutatorian. Tours of duty afloat, including serving as commanding officer of the Cutter Resolute, executive officer of Dauntless, commanding officer of Cape Current, deck watch officer of Decisive. He has also served as chief of the Office of Maritime and International Law in Washington here, as staff attorney of the 8th Coast Guard District in New Orleans, as head of the Operations Division of the Office of Maritime and International Law, and as legislative counsel for the Office of Congressional and Governmental Affairs in Washington. Admiral Michelle's an operator, a warrior in the war on drugs and others, a legal mind, an advisor to a cabinet officer, and a strategist, well-schooled and well-experienced military leader. Turning to Admiral Donegan. Uh, full disclosure, I used to work for Admiral Donegan, and in a sense, I still do. Um, he's the Acting Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Operations, Plans, and Strategy. He's the Acting N3, N5. He's a two-star officer in a demanding three-star job. He's a 1980 cum laude graduate of the University of Virginia, earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Aerospace Engineering. First operational assignment was as a plank owner to strike flight, Fighter Squadron 131, made the first East Coast deployment of the F-A-18, and culminated in the successful Libyan airstrikes in April 1986, a combat veteran. Served as a department head in Strike Fighter Squadron 37, XO of the George Washington, commanded Strike Fighter Squadron 131, made a deployment with that to uh, the Persian Gulf, and was, had the, uh, the Third Fleet command ship, USS Coronado, uh, during a demanding uh, period in, in its uh, career of service. Also commanded Carl Vinson on a combat deployment. Notice the recurring use of the word combat. Battle Force 7 Fleet, Carrier Strike Group 5 aboard USS George Washington, home ported in Japan. So he's an operator, most definitely. But sure, his most recent joint assignment was Director of Operations, the J-3 for the Central Command. So that's the J-3 for everything going on in the Middle East, um, uh, working uh, the joint issues, not just Navy. Served in the Pentagon in OPNAV as director of the Navy's Quadrennial Defense Review, big picture. Director of the Strategy and Policy Division, N-51, where I worked for him. Director of Warfare Integration, and as the aide administrative assistant to the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Plans, Policy, and Operations. Um, that's a whole mouthful of saying that he was Snuffy Smith's aide. And uh, if you, if you want to read high praise indeed, uh, go into Snuffy Smith's uh, oral history. Um, there's a lot of low praise uh, throughout. <laughs> but when he comes to Kid Donegan, um, it, it, it shines. Um, 
he then deployed to, uh, he then completed that tour, went to, as flag lieutenant uh, to the Commander Allied Forces Southern Europe in Naples, Italy. No coincidence, that was also Admiral Smith. Uh, and during that tour, deployed to Sarajevo as the NATO liaison officer to the Commander of the United Nations Protection Forces and served as the principal air advisor during NATO's deliberate force airstrikes. He's a graduate of the U.S. Navy Test Pilot School, the Navy Fighter Weapons School, Top Gun, the Navy Nuclear Power School, the U.S. Air Force Air Command and Staff College, the Joint Forces Staff College, and he completed Harvard Kennedy School's Executive Education Program in national and international security. An operator, a warrior, a policy expert, a maritime strategist, another well-schooled and deeply experienced flag officer. General Schrader, commander of the U.S. Marine Corps Systems Command. General Schrader enlisted in the Marine Corps and served for three years with the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines as an infantryman and was promoted to corporal. In a service that reveres uh, the trigger pullers and the riflemen at the E1, E2, E3 levels, uh, he's been there and he's done that. Uh, after his enlistment, he went on, got an associate degree in mechanical engineering technology, bachelor of science degree in electrical engineering technology from Bluefield State, went to the platoon leaders course and was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. Graduated from the basic school, went to artillery officer basic course in Fort Sill, and then reported to the 5th Battalion, 10th Marines, where he served as a guns platoon commander, battery executive officer, battery commander. Deployed to Southwest Asia during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, provide comfort. A warrior and a humanitarian. Brigadier General Schrader served as the, at the Marine Corps Recruit Depot at Paris Island as a recruit training company series commander, company executive officer, and company commander. He then attended the Field Artillery Advanced Officer course in Fort Sill, and then went to 3MEF, the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force in Okinawa, served as Assistant Operations Officer, 4th Marine Regiment, Battalion Operations Officer, Battalion Executive Officer with the 3rd Battalion, 12th Marines. Then went to the Marine Corps Command and Staff College, earned a Master's of Military Studies degree, and was transferred to the Marine Corps Systems Command, where he served as the Armor and Fire Support Targeting Team Lead. Reassigned to serve as the Deputy Program Manager to the Expeditionary Fire Support System. Returned to 3MEF, served as 12th Marines Operations Officer, later that same year deployed to Sumatra, Indonesia, in support of Operation United Assistance, humanitarian again. In May 2005, he received orders to stand up the 5th Anglico, 3rd MEF, deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, warrior again. Relinquished command of 5th Anglico was reassigned as the 3 MEF Force Fires Coordinator. August 2009, he was promoted to Brigadier General after graduating from ICAF, the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, and was then as designated an Acquisition Professional Officer and assigned to the Marine Corps Systems Command. And I'm sitting reading this bio and I'm going, he's been awfully busy and he's been at school. He obviously hasn't had time to read the newspapers. Why is he going into acquisition of all things at this time? And then it occurred to me, he's a Marine. Marines go to the sound of the guns. And uh, certainly the sound of the guns are booming uh, in the acquisition business. So he waited and has waited right into that. Over the next four years, he served as product group director for combat equipment and support systems, product group director and program manager for armor and fire support systems, transferred to the office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy, so up in the Navy Secretariat, um, to serve as Chief of Staff. And in 2014, earlier this year, took the helm as commander of the Marine Corps Systems Command. A warrior, humanitarian, organizer and trainer of Marines, acquisition professional, well-educated, experienced with troops, with experienced with hardware, and experienced in combat. Admiral Daly, you just simply could not have put together a finer panel, and it's a tribute to the United States military that they develop and create officers of the caliber that we have right here. And now I get to ask a few questions of these uh, paragons. So the theme, as Admiral Daly pointed out, of the forum is what does the nation need from the sea services? And 
we'll certainly hear, or we should hear, a great deal about that this afternoon uh, from the three members of the House of Representatives, congressmen with hands on the pulse of the nation and the needs of its citizens. But to set the scene for the discussion, I'm going to start off by asking each of these three very accomplished military leaders a necessary prior question. So what value does your service bring to the nation? What do you bring to the table uh, that, the Navy, that the nation would then need um, to, to, to use and, and to implement? Um, I'd ask you each not to take much more than about five or 10 minutes to answer each of these questions uh, so that we've got plenty of time for questions from the floor later on. And I'll start with, uh, with Admiral Michelle. Well, thank you very much. And I want to thank Admiral Daly and the Naval Institute for giving me the opportunity to talk with you this morning. This is a great opportunity to interface with uh, bunch of people who have oars in the water in the world of the Coast Guard as well as the other sea services. Uh, what value do we provide to the nation, Peter? Uh, I would argue that the Coast Guard really is a unique uh, instrument of national security and it has a number of different attributes uh, which make it not only unique in our government but really unique on the planet for what we bring to the fight. So the basic attributes of the Coast Guard are first and most importantly we're a military service. We interact with all the different combatant commanders. Many may know we have patrol boats, six patrol boats over in the Persian Gulf right now, uh, or the Arabian Gulf, uh, providing uh, assistance in that area. We also have uh, teams deployed in Afghanistan to assist with cargo movements. Those are just examples of some of the military things that we do, and we regularly deploy with combatant commanders. But we're also the nation's only military service. It's also a law enforcement agency. So the United States Coast Guard today is actively engaged here in the Western Hemisphere combating transnational organized criminals who are creating the instability in, in Central America that's causing things like 50,000 unaccompanied children to show up at the borders of the United States. The Coast Guard is intimately involved in that fight from a law enforcement perspective. We're also a, a humanitarian agency. Many of you may know us from uh, Coast Guard Alaska and similar shows on our search and rescue mission. Uh, we're known to be the world's experts, or we consider ourselves to be the world's experts on search and rescue, and that has been in our organizational DNA ever since the founding of the Coast Guard in 1790. We're also a regulatory agency and have responsibilities for the uh, commercial shipping and port management and waterways management for the nation. Uh, many of you may be reading in the press about the energy renaissance that is occurring in this country, and the United States Coast Guard is right in the middle of that with the movement of products, diluted bitumen, uh, crude oil coming out of the Bakken, which goes down the nation's uh, interior river systems. We're also involved in import and export of uh, petrochemicals, uh, liquefied natural gas, you name it, the Coast Guard is right in the middle of that, including working with the offshore industry, which is one of the most dynamic parts of this economy. Lastly, we're a member of the intelligence community and we bring some unique access and unique capabilities to the fight uh, that can't be replicated anywhere else in government. We also think that we serve as an, as an example to uh, the other navies of the world, many of which have these basic constabula constabulatory and sovereign uh, functions that the Coast Guard provides. And most of the world's navies, actually I would argue, uh, relate more to the Coast Guard than to the United States Navy just because of the, their size and their resource restraint, constraints and things like that they bring to the fight. So that's what we bring to the fight, Peter. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Admiral Donegan, the Navy. Well, thanks, Peter. I think uh, uh, I'll start out with saying that uh, we think the Navy, this nation needs a Navy that's uh, got three components. One, it's forward. Uh, two, it's engaged. And three, that it's ready. Uh, more simply put, we think the Navy needs a Navy uh, that's forward where it matters, when it matters. You've probably heard those words before, but uh, that forward Navy protects the international global system of trade and underwrites the security of our economy and our jobs here at home. Uh, but it's also a Navy that, uh, when it's forward, is engaged, assuring our allies and assuring our partners. And it's a nation uh, Navy that's ready uh, with credible combat power, uh, preventing and deterring wars in times of crisis, uh, providing decision space and options to the president, and when deterrence fails, a Navy that has the capacity and capability to fight and win. Uh, historically, I think that's what the Navy's been doing since the 1800s, when we first uh, moved out from being a coastal Navy uh, away from our shores. Uh, so let me just break those down, those three things down, the forward, uh, the engaged, and the ready, and, and put it in context of some real-world events that are going on. Uh, I said we were forward 
And when we operate forward, we have to have credible combat power to assure allies and build trust with partners. Uh, and that enhances regional stability. In times of crisis, I said that those naval forces are able to respond quickly, uh, to provide decision space, to provide options to the president. Well, I think on August 8th, uh, recently, just uh, one day after President Obama made the announcement that the United States was going to take action, the USS George H.W. Uh, Bush Carrier Strike Group, cruising in the Persian Gulf, launched F-18 Super Hornets, which struck the Islamic State of uh, Iraq and Levant targets near Erbil, Iraq. Now, the Bush was able to, the strike group was able to do that because they were there in theater. At that time, they were supporting operations in Afghanistan and other maritime security operations in the region. Uh, operating forward, our naval forces with cre credible combat power also provide options and decision space for the president. Uh, in some cases, uh, it's just that credible combat power that makes the difference. Let me give you an example. On 21 August uh, in 2013, uh, when we had first got indications that there were actual chemical attacks in Syria and they were confirmed. Within just several days, we had three destroyers on station with Tomahawk cruise missile capability. Uh, soon after that, they were joined by an amphibious ship, uh, another, uh, another destroyer, and the Nimitz carrier strike group came shortly after. At that time, you remember the nation was counting days to when military action was going to happen, strikes, uh, maybe potentially a road to war, but that's not what happened. This credible combat power was the catalyst, the pressure uh, that resulted in Syria finally committing to an agreement to turn over their chemical weapons. Uh, uh, these stories illustrate that it just makes sense that our nation needs our Navy ships, our submarines, our aircraft operating forward so they're going to be there where it matters, when it matters, and that we have to have credible combat power in that force that's forward. Because uh, they're, they're going to be the same force that follow on force that's going to have to fight and win force. I want to talk now about being engaged. While forward, our nation needs a Navy that's engaged with allies and partners in helping to ensure global stability. Uh, and you've all heard you can't surge trust. I want to take a little bit of a twist on that and say that with a lack of forward persistent presence and being forward and engaged, you can surge mistrust. In other words, when we try to put forces forward, if they hadn't been there, been engaged, and build up the credibility with our allies and partners, we may get the opposite uh, intended output from moving forces forward. Uh, of particular uh, importance to our nation, as you read in the strategy that Peter talked about, is the, is the Indo-Asia Pacific region. Our, our national strategy has us rebalancing to that reason, region. Uh, make no mistake, our Navy has been in that region for over 70 years. It's not new for us to be in the Asia Pacific region. In 2013, in the immediate after, aftermath of the typhoon that ravaged the Philippines, so this was just last year, the U.S. Navy was immediately on the scene. Uh, we had 50 aircraft and 50 ships uh, providing relief efforts uh, within, within hours and then within days. The clear message to the region was that the U.S. can be counted on. Uh, in fact, our actions became the catalyst for what was a recently negotiated agreement with the Philippines for more additional access and partnership, uh, and enhancing our already uh, a good alliance with the, with the Philippine government. At the same time, in that region, the increased in demands for energy combined with access challenges and the growing maritime and territorial disputes and sovereignty claims uh, in the region increased the likelihood for miscalculation. Instead, though, uh, of worrying, instead of going down a path where that could, could be an issue, it's our naval forces that are out there engaged in the region, identifying and fostering areas for cooperation and opportunity uh, so that those things can be de-escalated, not escalate. This past June, our Navy led to exercise RIMPAC in the waters near Hawaii that included 22 nations, 49 surface ships, six submarines, and more than 200 aircraft and 25,000 personnel, including China, for the first time. Think about it. Uh, at the land service or another place uh, doesn't have that water space, international water space, where you could get that kind of group together and conduct that kind of operation. More recently, just in November, the mine countermeasure exercise called ICMX was held in the Fifth Fleet Air Responsibility, and that was 6,500 people, 38 warships from 44 navies. Pretty impressive uh, that we can bring that kind of group together to build trust, confidence, capability, and interoperability. Also, this past year, we've joined with other uh, navies of the world to adopt this very tangible thing called Conduct for Unplanned Counters at Sea. It's called CUES. But it's a safety measure that's mean to, meant to limit mutual interference, really to limit uncertainty 
and potentially de-escalate situations where navies come in contact which, with each other in an unplanned way. So uh, again, the prime example of coordination between maritime services uh, that allow for this kind of activity. And then lastly, I'll talk about ready. Uh, this navy that's forward engaged must also be ready. Uh, it has to be ready with both the capabilities uh, to meet the threats, but with highly trained sailors that can make use of those capabilities. Uh, we're implementing now an optimized fleet response plan. What that is, it's, it, it's predictability. Predictability allowed us to get our maintenance done and predictability to allow our sailors to count on a deployment cycle and training cycle so that we can align and be much more efficient in the way we train uh, and work ourselves up ready for deployment. We're also bringing online innovative technologies uh, and concepts. Where it makes sense, we're putting more ships forward so we get more presence out of the ships we have. And that more ships forward include forward with their families, home ported uh, forward, uh, more ships to Japan, uh, some ships, more ships to road, an example, an additional submarine to Guam. But it also means putting ships forward where we may not have uh, a base to put families, but we'll rotate, rotate crews out of, like Singapore with, with LCS, for example. Uh, this innovation also includes modular capability. And you've heard the CNO talk about uh, 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 platforms and payloads. But the ability to plug and play, and, and when, we, when, it's time, when we need to upgrade, we can upgrade by not upgrading and buying an entire new platform, but we can upgrade with, with the uh, payloads that we need to to make ourselves current and relevant. A few months ago, the Navy deployed the very first afloat laser weapon system on the USS Ponce and Fifth Fleet. Uh, just this week, that system became operational, and you'll be hearing some, some of that uh, in the press here uh, soon. Uh, we're simultaneously leading an effort with our joint partners to develop a deployable railgun capability. Why are these kinds of innovations important for the Navy? Because for the first time, we'll be able to take and get uh, the cost curve in our favor. In other words, uh, instead of shooting million-dollar missiles to take out uh, tens of ten thousand-dollar uh, missiles that are shot at us, we'll be uh, we'll be employing weapons that are pennies on the dollar compared to the weapons that are that would be launched at us. In other words, a much more innovative and cost-effective way of doing business. Uh, so. As we, uh, in, in, in closing, some will say, uh, if our Navy is not forward and engaged and ready, uh, does it really matter? In other words, won't the goods still flow on that interconnected system of trade? Uh, won't the engine of our economy continue to run? Because other people will just step up and fill the gap because they have too much to lose. Uh, let's think about that for a moment. Uh, who would step in and fill that role in our absence? If history is any indication, uh, in the best of worlds, it would be someone without our interest at stake. Uh, but more likely, it's going to be a bully. I'm not going to name the names here, but you know who we're talking about here. Uh, they're going to leverage that advantage to their advantage, not to the, inter the, the advantage of uh, what would be international good order and discipline, so to speak. So in summary, our nation needs a Navy that's forward, engaged, and ready. So it'll be where it matters, when it matters, with credible power able to prevent and deter wars, but in times of crisis, provide options for the president, uh, and when necessary, uh, provide a sure access, and have the capability and capacity, uh, capability and capacity, that means size, to be able to fight and win. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, sir. General Schrader, what value does the Marine Corps bring to the nation? <laughs> so, Peter and, and Admiral Daly, I appreciate the opportunity to do this uh, on behalf of uh, General Dunford, Marine Corps appreciates. So, Two things. One is uh, I have to, a little bit of correction. Why did I give up my MOS, my combat arms MOS artillery, to become <laughs> acquisition to the sound of the guns? But I was given orders. So. <laughs> Marines follow orders. Or people and, die. Exactly, or people die. And then the second thing is uh, leave it to a Marine to go off the reservation. I've brought with me about six slides. I'm just going to go through these slides very quickly with some prepared remarks and try to answer the question for you. Um, so what does the Marine Corps bring to the nation? So the Marine Corps right now is we're in the process of rolling out a, um, a strategy which I think answers that question or vision which answers that question in the form of Expeditionary Force 21, um, which is the Marine Corps vision for designing and developing the force that will continue to fulfill our responsibilities as the nation's Naval Expeditionary Force in readiness. Through EF-21, we're going to chart a course over the next 10 years to field a Marine Corps uh, that will be the right force 
in the right place at the right time. EF-21 does not change what Marines do, but rather it changes how we do it. EF-21 provides an aspirational uh, vision of how we will operate in order to guide experimentation, force development, and inform our decisions. And most importantly, it's uh, going to improve how we support the geographic combatant commander's requirements. I think I'm driving here, right? Next slide. So as I said earlier, EF-21 does not change what Marines do, but rather how we're going to do it. Operational Maneuver from the Sea, or OMFTS, and uh, Ship to Objective Maneuver, STOM, remain valid. In fact, these operational concepts are now and have been executed by the Marine Corps. EF-21 reaffirms the surface assault as a core capability and requirement. It allows us to extend our operational reach from the sea by taking advantage of advantages in technology such as the MV-22 Osprey, the CH-53 Kilo, the AH-1 Zulu helicopter, the UH-1 Yankee helicopter, the F-35 Bravo, which is coming on board, and our unmanned aerial systems. It allows us to reduce our air and surface maneuver signature by having ship and a sea-based stage at greater ranges which also increases their survivability by exposing them to less risk for shore-based enemy assets or from shore-based enemy assets. The takeaway here is pretty simple and it's, and it's uh, time tested. It's all still about maneuver warfare and being able to maneuver from greater distances from the sea in order to avoid enemy surfaces and exploit their gaps in their defenses, but at a greater depth throughout the littorals. In essence, high-speed littoral maneuver. Next slide. So the MEB. The MEB and its CONOPS, or its concept of operations, are an integral part of EF-21. We've always had MUSE and MEBs, but what we haven't focused on is rapid deployment of the MEB forward. Through, through compositing forward deployed special purpose MAGTAFs, MUSE, and other in-theater forces and assets. Through EF-21, we'll provide geographic, again, provide the geographic combatant commander with a task-organized MEB capable of rapidly responding to crises and, con and contingencies within a joint and coalition framework within 12 to 24 hours. That's the goal. The MEB command, command element is the centerpiece of this. By compositing forces, it is scalable and task-organized to the mission at hand. The MEB will provide, the, again, the, the geographic combatant commander, a flag officer-led combined joint task force, capable command element, deployable in hours with the right command and control capability, regionally oriented, and established habitual relationships. So a very unique capability. EF-21 will enhance littoral maneuver through advanced sea basing and an enhanced family of connectors. The development and proliferation of anti-access and aerial denial capabilities threaten freedom of action. This requires establishing advanced bases and austere expeditionary sites for employment of distributed short takeoff or stovel landing operations, which serves as an enabler for sea control and power projection. To complement the operational reach of our vertical connectors, our helicopters and our tilt rotor air aircraft, we're exploring a new generation of surface connectors that enable us to maneuver through the littorals to gain positional advantage. We remain dedicated to exploring holistic concepts of operation and launching assaults from a combination of amphibious ships um, reinforced by sea-based platforms. We will also strengthen our partnership with the Navy and by, I'm sorry, we'll also strengthen our partnership with the Navy by integrating our operational staffs and institutionalizing concepts of employment. Finally, Fielding these high-speed, long-range, high-capacity systems of connectors, amphibious vehicles, boats, as well as the ships that project the forward, that project them forward, uh, are necessary for modernized amphibious operations. Ground combat tactical vehicle strategy, almost there. In conjunction with the F-21, we've also reassessed our ground combat tactical vehicle portfolio and established a modernization strategy which calls for mostly recapitalization and upgrades to selected systems while also modernizing our assault amphibian capability, which, by the way, remains the Marine Corps' highest ground equipment procurement priority. 
the ACV. As you can see, most of our ground combat tactical vehicle portfolio uh, reaches the end of its life, its life cycle between the years 2020 and 2035, which is when our modernization efforts for the JLTV, or the Joint Lightweight Tactical Vehicle, and the Amphibious Combat Vehicle um, are centralized and focused. EF-21 challenges the entirety of the Marine Corps enterprise to rethink how we form, train, equip, organize, and employ naval forces to field capabilities and, and capacities. Accordingly, and in conjunction with the Marine Corps Service Campaign Plan, we have derived our POM 17 planning guidance and capability gaps, which you see here. Our top 10 capability gaps are depicted and are, in a, are an, an indication of the Marine Corps' vigorous pursuit of capabilities which will enhance our amphibious capability and capacity. So in closing, I offer this quote from our current Commandant, General Dunford, which I do believe captures the purpose and essence of EF-21 and the Marine Corps' continued focus on our role as the nation's crisis response force being the right force in the right place at the right time. Sir, General, I look thanks. forward to your discussion. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, I think the, 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 the opening line of that last uh, quote is, uh, is, is pretty important, having to do with the changes that we've seen in the world. Uh, the services bring a great deal to the nation, as we've just heard, uh, but the world keeps changing, and the environment that the nation is existing in uh, changes, especially regarding national security and national defense. So the next question is, what do you see as the most important of those changes um, for your service? What are the uh, challenges? What are the, 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 uh, the challenges that you see facing your service today, uh, and what changes have happened in the world that, that may be influencing uh, how you're looking at strategy and policy and uh, operations and, uh, and systems development? And so I'd like to, uh, to start with uh, General Schrader and then ask uh, Admiral Michelle and then finally Admiral Donegan uh, that question. General Schrader. So I, I think the, probably the biggest challenges that we're facing, and, and I come at this again from an acquisition, mostly from an acquisition perspective, is um, I think what the Commandant has articulated as well is, is finding the balance between readiness and modernization. The Commandant has made a conscious decision to put readiness first. And I think as you, you saw in that one slide where I talked about the um, ground combat tactical vehicle portfolio, there was a number of vehicle platforms on there. I think there were uh, 10 platforms on there. And, and of those 10 platforms, uh, several of them are, are or have already reached the end of their um, service, expected service life cycle. And so what we're having to do is, is we're having to, to find innovative ways to extend that service, the life cycle of those capabilities, while at the same time, to, to increase or maintain readiness, while at the same time resetting our equipment as it comes back from 10, 12 years of, of conflict, regain an acceptable and maintain an acceptable readiness rating. Also, we have to, like I said, we have to find a balance for modernization. So we have very selectively and very deliberately decided that we're going to take some risk in modernization to some of those capabilities. But we're going to also invest in modernization where we need it and where I think we need it. And you, can, you saw from those top 10 priorities there was in our amphibious capability. Hence, that's why we're going after our, a new amphibious combat vehicle. Right now we're going after the ACV, which is complementary to the AAV, but at some point in time, um, we will probably move on to an enhanced uh, self-deploying capability that will be a new type of vehicle um, to replace the AAV. So challenges, constrained budgets, maintaining readiness so that we can fight tonight, as the Marine Corps you know, has said, right force, right time, in the right place, fight tonight. Sure. Sir. Sure. Admiral Michelle, change, challenges, the Coast Guard. Lot, lots of change and lots of challenges. As a matter of fact, I was, I was taking notes on what General Schrader said, because that was my number one thing in the Coast Guard as well, the, the balance between readiness and recapitalization or modernization. 
you know, we've got a fleet of ships that is our medium endurance cutters, which are between 30 and 50 years old. Projected service lives on these things are up to 60 years before their replacement comes online. And we've had a lot of challenges there with uh, acquiring the capacities that we need for our national security cutter and our uh, hoped for offshore patrol cutter or OPC, which is the replacement for our medium endurance cutters. We also have a looming life, uh, excuse me, icebreaker uh, issue out there as well. Uh, we've got some challenges with our polar ice breaking fleet, but I echo what you say there. And one of the big changes and challenges out there is the budget environment. It's been so uncertain and unstable, it uh, creates a lot of difficulty, particularly with requiring capital assets. That's one of our challenges. The other things, I'm not going to take too much time. You all live in this world as well as I do, so none of these will probably come as too much of a surprise to you, but the management of technology is going to be a challenge for us. Uh, as we get better, our adversaries get better, and uh, we've got to embrace all the different types of technology that's out there. It's mandatory to be able to do so. We've got to take a look at the world of transnational criminal organizations. Uh, this is kind of the dark side or the, the underbelly of globalization is you've got some very sophisticated organizations out there that actually have the ability to challenge nation states in, in many respects who are doing some incredibly bad things and we've got to figure out as a nation how we're going to deal with those. I mentioned before about the energy piece. The United States Coast Guard is right in the middle of that uh, energy uh, issue which plays into a, a much broader geopolitical context. You can see with the dropping oil prices, how that's going to impact countries like Russia, uh, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, and Venezuela's friends like Cuba and, and some of the other ones. I mean, this is, these are very big muscle movements here as the United States becomes not only the biggest producer of energy today, but potentially an energy exporter, which completely changes a lot of geopolitical calculations. Got the world of cyber out there. Coast Guard's right in the middle of that. Uh, again, uh, not an optional task to be engaged in the cyber domain. As we get better with technology, it creates additional vulnerabilities of which a whole range of different actors exploit that. So we've got to get our hands around cyber. Dealing with the Arctic and climate change is another piece that the Coast Guard's got to deal with in our polar regions. We've got a lot more human activity up there, whether it's cruise ships, drilling, uh, exploitation of resources, a uh, whole challenge of the world up there. And I will tell you, our icebreaker fleet is terribly undercapitalized right now. We have one functioning icebreaker built in the 70s. It was actually offline for a number of years before we were able to rehab it. It's on its way down south to break out McMurdo Sound, but compare that with the Russian icebreaking fleet, which even includes nuclear icebreakers. I mean, we're a long ways behind on our icebreaking capability. Lastly, in one, one piece which is unique to my uh, agency is we're a part of the Department of Homeland Security. And our Department of Homeland Security continues to mature over time. You may have seen Secretary Johnson talking about the Southern Border and Approaches Campaign Plan, which would be our first time, at least systemically, to try to create joint or integrated operations along the lines of Goldwater Nichols for a department that doesn't have a Goldwater Nichols. So it's a very interesting exercise that we deal with as the Coast Guard. But world of extreme dynamic change, we try to be as nimble as, as possible to match our adversaries. Very difficult to do when things like transnational criminal organizations can dial up sort of every element of bad guy power, you know, just at the, at the uh, you know, by making a phone call or, or giving a command. But we've, that's going to be our challenge for the future is being able to adapt to that change and hopefully at some point get ahead of all those change factors I talked about. Oh. Emerald Donegan, what changes have particularly concerned the Navy and what challenges does the Navy see based on those changes? Well, I think what I'll take is, uh, I think, I think uh, Joe and, and Chuck covered pretty well uh, uh, changes uh, relative to the budget and, and things close mm -hmm. to home here and some of the other broader things. Well, maybe what I'll do is just change the baseline a little bit, Peter, and, uh, <clears throat> and talk back to what's changed since 2007 and now. And the reason I want to take the 2007 period, and Hamill Daly's looking at me a little bit crooked, because that was when we, as three services, uh, uh, first together wrote a, a maritime strategy that uh, was tri-service and uh, and as you know uh, together we're working on revising uh, that strategy and part of the decision calculus was us looking at what has changed that would ne need to, uh, us to relook at that strategy or to make a revision to it so I'll take maybe that tact and, and, and sure. throw a couple things out there first uh, you, uh, it was mentioned before I think by uh, Admiral Daly about 
Uh, there's new strategic guidance on the street, the defense strategic guidance from 2012. We also had a quadrennial defense review. Uh, and then that has to be put in context of the things that you talked about, about uh, uh, can our resources match that strategy. Uh, there's changes in the fiscal environment that were well covered here. Uh, but remember, it comes on the, uh, what's still looming in front of us is Budget Control Acts, and that comes on the heels of our sequestration that impacted us in 13. So those are changes that we didn't have, uh, uh, those two things were changes that we didn't have back in 2007 uh, in front of us. Even though we looked at alternate futures, we didn't have that specificity. Uh, this uh, rebalance to the Asia Pacific or increasing focus of in, in Asia Pacific. Uh, as I said, we've always been there, but in terms of Asia Pacific, it's certainly growing uh, in both its uh, economic strength and the military strengths of countries in those regions. Uh, and of course, remember, that's where our longstanding alliances are and how we deal with those in the face of those changes uh, and tensions that are out there, as you know, because of sovereignty and territorial claims. Uh, and, and as there's uh, mature. Uh, also, uh, I want to talk for a second about anti-access and area denial of weapons, not because of a particular country owns them, but because of the proliferation of those weapons. Uh, that's a challenge that we uh, will face in multiple regions, not just one, and it doesn't have to be a nation state that uh, has those capabilities. And how we deal with those is something we're going to have to have a strategy that can, uh, that can address. Uh, Terrorism was talked about briefly, or at least the transnational crime portion of it. But terrorism, you know, when we used to think of it, we thought about Al Qaeda in Pakistan and Afghanistan as terrorism, uh, maybe a little bit in Yemen with uh, AQAP, but that's a whole different world now. The terrorism, uh, the nexus of that, the interconnection of it with transnational crime, uh, it's much more complex. We've got Al Qaeda, uh, AQAP in Yemen, but we have Al Shabaab, Boko Haram in Africa. We have this emerging Islamic state of Iraq and Levant in both. Uh, Iraq and Syria, and then we have uh, all the other groups that are now trying to decide where they're going to line up uh, with those. Am I going to line up with Al-Qaeda? Am I going to line up with ISIL or not? That's, that is something that we hadn't thought about uh, to that level, or it certainly didn't, uh, didn't address as much. Uh, there's also been a thought that we could, as if we were going to rebalance to the Pacific, that we could step away from uh, commitments in other regions, whether those be the Middle East and Europe. And I think you're all watching what's happening now with uh, Russians' intervention uh, in the Crimea and subsequent uh, into eastern Ukraine. Uh, and uh, we're seeing what's happening now in the Middle East. So stepping away from places uh, that we were maybe thought we could before, I don't know if that's uh, uh, true or not. Uh, and then our potential adversaries have this game-changing uh, uh, ways they can play that, uh, 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 at a higher level now in an asymmetric means. And, and uh, Chuck talked about it in terms of cyber. You know, a couple of weeks ago, Admiral Rogers, uh, he gave a very uh, interesting quotes that he made about uh, what the capabilities of some of these actors were. I'm not going to repeat them now in front of you because you can go look them up. But basically, he was saying, you know, they have tremendous capability, and we have to honor that and be ready to deal with it. Uh, the natural resource uh, impacts, I think, were covered well by, by Chuck in terms of energy demand and climate, uh, as were transnational crime. I'll say that piracy is still out there. Uh, although uh, we've been able to beat it down in some places, it certainly continues to be a concern. So those are some of the challenges, not all, Peter, that, uh, that we're facing, uh, that we have to make sure that uh, as we do uh, move forward with our strategy that we're considering all of those. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. Um, and my last question is focused on strategy. Uh, the CNO, and Admiral Daly alluded to this, has said that a revised maritime strategy agreed to and signed by the service chiefs of all three sea services, your bosses, um, will be published very soon. That's his phrase, very soon. Um, what can you share about the new strategy? And uh, Admiral Donegan, since you work for the CNO, I think this bud is initially for you. And then uh, uh, I'll ask General Schrader and uh, Admiral Michelle to comment from the standpoint of their services on the strategy. Admiral Donegan. Hey, you're giving me this one first, huh, Peter? Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, let me start out with it. I'm not going to get into the specifics and roll out the strategy today. Uh, uh, load the person that gets out ahead of their boss, let alone three bosses uh, from three different services. I don't think that's a good uh, career-enhancing move. That's why I um, came with slides. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I have that clicker? <laughs> uh, now, that said, this is a tough audience, and uh, everyone here has an idea of what's in a strategy. As a matter of fact, Peter Schwartz is the expert about telling you what's in, or if you write one, what you left out. Uh, but uh, 
so I want to, what I want, what I think I can do here is cover at least for you <laughs> the thought process and the decisions we had to make, but I may not tell you the decisions. So in some cases, I'll give you a little hint to, on the decisions because they're straightforward and you already know them. But in others, I'll tell you what we were, what we're choosing behind. And then film at 11 for you to go away for us to, to read. But uh, our first decision, of course, was an easy one. And it was uh, whether we should write service-specific strategies again or do this uh, unique thing we did in the past, which is a tri-service strategy. Uh, we didn't hesitate on that one. Uh, this is a tri-service strategy. You're going to see it in that way, uh, just like the cooperative strategy for 21st Sea Power was. Uh, but how we describe the posture and employment of a global force, uh, I think, is important. Do you focus on two hubs of power projection? And two places of the world, the Middle East or the Western Pacific, or do you articulate that more regionally or globally balanced? Re referring to what I talked about, uh, can we step out of any one place? Have we found that's been viable over time? Uh, do we try to match our specific capabilities to regions, uh, to places? Do we have that luxury of doing that? You know, do we, uh, or, you know, or do we still need a one-size-fits-all force that can be uh, able to be moved to wherever it's needed, uh, when it's needed, and, and have that high-end capability all the time? Uh, to what extent do we depend on our allies and partners? Uh, clearly, uh, CS21, Cooperative Strategy for 21st Century, put a lot of credence in dependent on, on our partners. But also there's other entities, there's groups now that have uh, certain uh, uh, capabilities now, uh, whether they be ASEAN or the GCC, uh, and, and how can we bring those, uh, uh, look at, how do we look at talking about those countries? Uh, do we articulate, this is always the million dollar question, the specifics of force structure? and what that is in terms of numbers or capabilities in, in, in our strategy. Too much detail, uh, risks uh, a quickly in, inaccurate or maybe dated document if some significant budget piece happens. Uh, but to leave it out, uh, maybe it'll take some potency out of uh, what we're trying to uh, say and achieve uh, and may not convey a coherent plan. Uh, how do we characterize the threat? Uh, this, is, uh, this is important. Uh, decision that we had to make. Do we talk about specific threats or do we talk about generically about the capabilities? Uh, and if we talk about the threats, which ones do you choose? And how do you then talk about them? Do you group them together or talk about them individually? Tough choices, uh, but important choices because uh, the critics of, uh, of strategies will, will, have, uh, will beat you up on these kinds of things that I'm talking about. Uh, in terms of allies and partners, which ones do we call out and which ones don't we call out? Uh, you know, so you can look at some of our allies and partners and see that uh, those nations have some gone in different directions. So, uh, you know, how we talk about them is important. And leaving one out as opposed to another uh, or emphasizing one more than another is always a challenge in how you do that. Uh, then we have choices and priorities. Uh, you heard me say before that some of our priorities are enduring. I guarantee you uh, that uh, the following things will play a leading role in the strategy. And it's not a secret. Forward presence is going to be important to especially the Marine Corps and the Navy. And the Coast Guard uh, is, is absolutely with us there in, in several of our regions. Uh, balancing that with their shift and, and focus on the Western Hemisphere, but they're absolutely with us, uh, if not with their ships, with, with, uh, with the rest of their forces in these other places. Building and continuing the partnerships that we have and, and rolling those in and how we talk about that, that's definitely uh, something that's going to have be enduring. And then you know about the missions that are out there that are for sure enduring, deterrence, sea control, power projection, maritime security, things like HADR. But are there are other emergent priorities that now needed a related uh, uh, function or way of talking about it? This need for global access that I just talked about, uh, leveraging uh, these emergent technologies, or how do we play in the cyber domain and those kind of things? How are we going to describe that? Are we going to use the same a bins uh, of the way we talk about our forces there, or are we going to uh, be a little bit more innovative on how we talk about those? Uh, as you know, the Secretary of Defense has rolled out innovation. I talked a little bit about it in terms of the Navy, uh, partly because uh, I know that uh, the appetites are there. Uh, he's talked about his defense innovative initiative, but innovation uh, isn't all about the things you buy and do. It's about concepts and the way you deploy and employ your forces, and we're going to uh, you know, how does the strategy talk about these new concepts? And, and you've seen, seen us uh, roll out some of them before. And some of them are how we train, that optimized fleet response plan, and making sure that is, uh, is going to get us the best forces that we possibly can. So uh, uh, I didn't give you the answers, but I took you through some of the calculus of our decision processes. Uh, you can ask me the hard questions on which choice uh, later, and I'll defer to the Marine Corps for those answers. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Uh, 
Thank you, sir. Uh, speaking of the Marine Corps, General Schrader, so, so what has been your service's particular approach and concerns in working with the other two sea services on the strategy? What uh, choices and issues have been important to you? So, so um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you back to what I said uh, in my opening remarks, which is when it, when it comes to strategy, I think what you're going to see, which is, which is in the Marine Corps' DNA, always has been in our DNA, is, is crisis response force, forward deployed, always ready. And, and again, I, I don't think you're going to see us change fundamentally what we do, but maybe how we do it. And, and that's what led us to, again, Expeditionary Force 21. S some other things that, that I think that uh, you may see that are going to come out here is, is – um, and it's already starting to roll out, is how we're strategically deploying special purpose MAGTAFs. We're, we are strategically replacing those special purpose MAGTAFs, um, task organized in certain uh, geographic locations throughout the globe to enhance not only the MUSE that are already out there, but like I said earlier, the ability for us to composite the Marine Expeditionary Brigade forward, have that brigade command element that's already there on, on site, be it first, second, or third MEB, already geographically oriented, um, and be able to fall in on those, either the special purpose MAGTAF, composite the MUSE, and then uh, be able to, to bring to bear a decisive action with a MEB or even two MEBs and forward. So I think, I mean, if, again, if I could just sum it up, I think it's, it's not you're not going to see a change in, in our DNA, uh, what we do, but again, how we do it, which is MEB-centric and forward-deployed MEBs, able to composite those forward, sir. Thank you, sir. Irma Michelle, you get the uh, final word. You're senior, and your and your service is senior. So go ahead. There you go. Well, uh, not to get too far ahead uh, of my service chief, whatever kid said. So, <laughs> no, but... Just a couple things here. First of all, uh, like, like Kid said, we're all in on this document. It's got to be done. The nation demands that its sea services work well together. It didn't, didn't create us to be redundant. It created us to actually be synergistic. So in my mind, one plus one plus one actually equals more than three when you put all of us together, sharing our authorities, capabilities, competencies, and partnerships. And this document is, is reflective of that. I mean, the reality of the document is, is uh, you know, there's more demand for its sea services than the nation currently has. So the document makes value judgments, uh, you know, where we're going to put emphasis. And that's a good thing. I mean, it, it shows a conscious effort to, again, employ all our three services to buy down the most risk that's possible. The document also tries to buy down risk by understanding that this is not just the U.S. You know, the creation of partnerships with our, our foreign partners and allies is absolutely critical. The ability to leverage each other's capabilities, competencies, and partnerships uh, really is kind of the way to go into the future. Uh, the document also talks about the type of assets that are necessary here. So it wouldn't come as any surprise to you when you're talking about a cooperative strategy that those assets should be flexible, adaptable, interoperable, you know, those type, of, those type of issues that are contained in the document. So, again, from a Coast Guard perspective, uh, we're all about the cooperative strategy. Uh, we're uh, what we like to call uh, bureaucratically multilingual as the Coast Guard. We fit in a lot of different places and we do a lot of different things. And we think we bring a lot to the fight that helps out the Marine Corps and the Navy. And we know that the Navy brings a lot to the fight that helps out the United States Coast Guard. And this strategy is emblematic of that partnership. So, thanks. Admiral, uh, thanks very much. So that obviously concludes the formal program here on the stage, uh, but now comes the important part, uh, answering your questions, listening to your comments. Admiral Daly, how much time have we got? Uh, we've still got about 30 minutes here. 30 minutes. Who's got the first question? Yes, sir. Could you tell us who you are and uh, what your affiliation is? Admiral Michel, um, you were talking about, you've been talking a lot about, about foreign partners and allies, and I, I hesitate to say foreign because they're right next door to the Canadians. Um, <laughs> but you were also talking about uh, icebreakers. And I wondered, um, up in Ottawa at the moment, there's, I think, a lot of discussion about um, how it is that the, uh, the DND can afford to uh, build a fleet of, and the 
size of this is it keeps, keeps going back and forth between four to eight Arctic patrol ships. Um, I heard the joke recently uh, here in Washington, if you want to get somebody's attention, the only word that gets close to Benghazi is Arctic. If you say Arctic, that, that charges people <laughs> up now. Um, I wondered if the Coast Guard has given any consideration to um, trying to work with the RCN and the DND to, to, to meet those American and Canadian requirements for Arctic ice breaking uh, together. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Canada is obviously one of our closest partners. And we work with them on a whole range of different issues. Just on the icebreaker issue, you know, we've been talking about polar icebreaking, but understand there's a whole other world of icebreaking that goes on that's absolutely essential to both our economies on the Great Lakes and also on our river systems. For example, this winter that we just had up in the Great Lakes was the worst winter we'd had up there in over 30 years. I mean, virtually all the Great Lakes were completely covered in ice. And I can tell you this as a Coast Guardsman, without Canada and the Canadian ice breaking capability, we would, have, we would have not been able to keep those waterways open to the extent that we could. And all types of goods and services that are necessary for the functioning of this economy move across those waterways. And I just can't say enough about Canada and, and their pitching in to help us make sure those waterways were done. But yeah, we talk to them all the time. Uh, we've talked to them about polar ice breaking capability. Part of the problem is there's just a handful of nations that actually have polar icebreakers. Polar icebreakers are a different class than the medium icebreakers that a lot of countries run. There's just a handful of countries that have those capabilities. And you really have to have those capabilities or you end up getting stuck in the ice. Remember we saw the Shui Long, the Chinese ship, and the Russian icebreaker that were both trapped in the ice down there in Antarctica. And we sent one of our ships. Fortunately, the wind changed direction and moved in another way. But uh, you've got to have some really serious capability. The, the, the two polar icebreakers we have right now, one of which is broken, uh, are the most powerful non-nuclear icebreakers on planet Earth. But we as a nation are going to really struggle here. We haven't built a polar icebreaker here in over 40 years. The types of steels and technology uh, that is necessary to create this type of craft has largely atrophied in this nation. So we've reached out to countries not only like Canada, but also Sweden, Finland, who has some of these capabilities. And we are probably going to have to rely on our foreign partners to a larger extent than we have in any of our acquisitions when we build this polar icebreaker. And the Canadians, if we build this polar icebreaker, it's about over $1 billion price tag on that, which is not easy to get around, around town these days. But yes, those lines of communication are open with a whole range of foreign partners because we have to have it, because we organically do not have that capability in the United States. And that's kind of a tragedy that the nation has let us uh, go that far along. But yes. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Who's next? Yes, sir. Hi, thank you all very much. Uh, Josh Tallis from uh, the University of St. Andrews. Um, this is primarily for Admiral Michelle, but it's, it's applicable also particularly to the Navy. Um, in congressional testimony, both you and uh, General Kelly down at Southcom have mentioned you receive about 5% of uh, sort of the necessary uh, resources down in Jayat of South to combat you know, cocaine trafficking and transnational organized crime. With the, the budget environment and sort of the expectation that there won't be, you know, a ramp up of 95% in resources for South Common Jet of South, how are you reconceptualizing, um, you know, drug trafficking, sorry, drug trafficking strategy, counter narcotic strategy, and strategy for countering transnational organized crime? Yeah, that's a good question. They've, they've had a, and, and I was JADF South director, and they've had a resource challenge down there for a long time, primarily in the surface vessels. And there are various reasons for that. The Coast Guard's had its recapitalization difficulties. The Navy has, uh, on its, the lower end ships that we typically get down there, the frigates are being decommissioned, and the replacement for them is a littoral combat ship, which, you know, has been rather slow coming out. I, I would like to see that come out. The, we actually had LCS's work for us down at JADF, and boy, what an incredible ship, and, and tailor-made for that mission set. So I guess when times get tough on, on uh, on ships down there, we just get more innovative. I used to have a member of my staff who would say, trauma breeds innovation. And I said, well, I could do with a little bit less trauma, you know, although I like the innovation aspects of that. But what we're actually doing down there, and you'll see it in the Coast Guard's Western Hemisphere strategy, line of effort number one on that is combating networks. And it's all about network identification and attack strategy. So it's all about using whole of government intelligence to make the assets that we have down there as smart as possible. My goal when I was JADA South Director was every turn of a propeller on a ship or a plane down there should be done with specific intent. 
Now, we haven't gotten all the way to that goal, and we still do some sort of patrolling in the areas, but that's where we've got to get to, is really get inside those networks, and there are some very sophisticated ways that we do it, uh, working with both the intelligence community partners as well as our law enforcement partners, where probably 95% of the, of the products that are removed down there are done based on intelligence and different intelligence techniques. And we need to continue to apply those to make sure that the scarce ships that we have are more and more effective. And the assets down there are absolutely critical to the, not only our nation, but the nations that happen to exist between the only three countries where cocaine is produced on planet Earth, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia, and the number one market, which is the United States. And those countries in Central America right now are in a, a tremendous, tremendous fight. And we owe it to them as part of a cooperative strategy, since we create the demand for these products, to try to police up to the extent possible. Last year, Jada South, I think, facilitated probably upward of, upwards of 100 metric tons of cocaine that was moved off the water before it could get into Central America or into to cities in the United States. Not only is that a tremendous funding mechanism for the bad guys, it's the bulk of what the United States and all our partners remove from planet Earth. I think something like 60% of the cocaine removed from planet Earth was done by those Coast Guard and Navy ships that operate uh, down there for Jadif South. So it's an incredibly important mission set. It's a national security objective as well as a public health objective and a law enforcement problem. And we're doing everything possible to make sure those assets that are provided to us are used as effectively as possible. Uh, what we're doing from the Navy side is uh, taking a really hard look at, uh, uh, as, as our frigates come offline, which they are, uh, what can we do to provide Fourth Fleet and Southcom with assets uh, from a realistic standpoint? In other words, we know the high-end vessels are going to be taken off to other places. So we're looking hard at what we're doing with our PC ships, uh, our, our joint high-speed vessels and where we're placing those, and our other uh, platforms that have a capability that we could or couldn't put on uh, some surveillance uh, uh, assets and such, and which ones we could reconfigure, how much that costs, does it make sense to do it? Uh, and, and such, because we know that uh, in, the, in the rule of the way we apportion our assets across the globe, uh, the high-end assets are not going to get placed down there given the other things that are going on in the world. So this is uh, what we've been working hard uh, very recently with uh, both uh, Fourth Fleet and, and Southcom on is, is laying out those options as we go forward. But there's not an easy answer, and there's not, uh, uh, not going to be an instantaneous fix to that issue. Thank you very much. Who's next? People are all starving for lunch. Yes, Admiral? I'm Sally Bryce O'Hara, retired Coast Guard. And this is probably an easy question, but I remember the last time the strategy was released, there was a very deliberative effort to increase understanding across America. And there were town halls and listening and talking sessions around the country. Was that successful? Is there thinking that you will try and do something like that again? Or are there other ideas that you have to promulgate this when we talk about what does the nation need from the sea services? Part of it is just education on what the sea services do for our country. Thanks. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Uh, and, and I was pretty active in uh, what you were talking about before back in 2007. <laughs> Uh, as was Jamie Fogo, who's somewhere around here, uh, I know, hiding in the corners, but he should probably stand up and answer this question. Uh, but, uh, uh, but he's a man without portfolio right this second. So uh, the answer to that question, was it successful? I'll let you all be the judge of whether it was successful or not. Educating the entire country is a hard prospect for, for anyone to do. So uh, there absolutely is a, is a rollout plan that, we're, that we have and that we're working on. We haven't got it completely approved yet that we're going to, uh, do and and, and uh, a, a large portion of that has to do with education, and we're looking hard at where we target that uh, education and how we talk about uh, it. Uh, there are plenty of venues that ex already exist for us to get the word out as long as we are coherent, stay on message, and, and do that. Uh, so, uh, in answer to your question, I probably don't foresee that uh, conversation with a country type thing happening uh, this time around. But you're absolutely going to see. Uh, uh, a, a uh, public affairs and information uh, rollout uh, plan that accompanies the strategy uh, and, is, and, and it won't be episodic. We're, we're planning on this to be uh, 
uh, a constant thing because we're going to have we know we're going to have to repeat ourselves uh, as we go through the process. Uh, if you look what's in front of us uh, with the budget cycle and the other things that are going to impact us starting in uh, January forward, uh, it's actually opportune that we start coming out at, uh, soon and start talking about this. So I think we're we're well timed, and the how is something that uh, we're still working on. We have a good plan. We just haven't uh, promulgated it yet. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Lieutenant JG Chris O'Keefe. I'm uh, my second day at OPNAV N96, Director of Surface Warfare. I actually just came from Fourth Fleet, sir. Um, perhaps you could, Mr. Schwartz, maybe you could help me with this as well in your, in your uh, strategy hat. I'm trying to understand. I had a great opportunity to speak with Mike Rogers a couple weeks ago, Admiral Rogers, and some congressional staffers. And there was a lot of discussion, I think some angst in trying to even articulate the, lex the strategic lexicon for how to deal with cyber and how it kind of, it sort of permeates all of the strategic discussions and platforms and policies and geographical placements. And what came apparent, at least in my mind, and maybe I'm wrong, was I didn't quite see what the proper venue or forum was to have the discussion. So it, it touched all aspects. So there was platform discussions, there was congressional discussions, and how maybe recent NSA disclosures had impacted the ability to discuss this issue in Congress. So Congress maybe wasn't the best forum, and maybe there were some strategic issues where there were some other tough discussions on the military side. What is the best forum in a, to discuss cyber strategy as it overlays things like this discussion? What, do, what does the nation need for our cyber services? How do we handle that question? How do, wh where do we go to find the answers and the venue to talk about it? Um, <laughs> far be it for me to get out in front of my bosses. Um, I, th I think he called you out, Peter, on this okay. one. Yeah. <laughs> The answer, the answer, I believe, is there is no one single best forum. I think it has to be done, as in any of these kinds of things, including the strategy, in many, many layers. There's aspects of cyber that are at levels of classification that nobody in this room has, and forum, fora have to be created and have to be used to deal with it there. There's also the pages of proceedings. There are the blogosphere. There are a number of other areas where Perfectly adequate and, and important discussion of cyber issues can and should take place. Some of them led by government leaders who are trying to drive things, and some of them just welling up from concerned citizens both in and out of uniform. My own sense is that it all has to take place, and if you're really lucky, you get sort of a perfect storm situation where war gamers, exercisers, the blogosphere, the pages of proceedings, the Naval War College Review articles, uh, the speeches of flag officers, the deliberations within the Pentagon, and yes, on the Hill regarding the budget and how much and how well it's going to be funded, are all operating synergistically to move knowledge and move policy forward. That, that, would, be, that would be my answer to it. You know, if, if I could just say it, this may not at the strategic level when it comes to cyber, but I will tell you that this, just in the last four months in, in my job as the Commander of Marine Corps Systems Command, we are responsible for procuring hardware and software that goes into the Marine Corps network, i.e. cyber. And within the defense acquisition framework, which in my mind right now is actually, it's a deliberate framework. Um, it is frustrating in the sense that I think it's well designed to build and procure big platforms. But when it comes to cyber, uh, it, it, it's, I think it's a challenge because what's happening is, is we're, if we use the defense acquisition framework in a deliberate manner, we're able to procure and field yesterday's technology tomorrow because, because IT moves so fast, cyber moves so fast. It is, it is no kidding, I think a, a battlefield, a domain that we have to get our arms around and it starts down at that tactical level with managing those networks, protecting those networks, and how do we get out in front of that, that technology developmental curve so that we're not procuring and fielding yesterday's technology tomorrow. So that's a problem I've laid out there. I do have some, uh, some folks within my command. I got a lieutenant colonel that I put in charge of it to try to help us figure that out. So we do recognize cyber is, uh, is a challenge. Getting our arms around it is, is, uh, is going to continue to take some effort. 
I'll just offer that. You were, you were talking about what forms to discuss it at. Uh, and, and I'm going to state the obvious. Basically, our military concepts, our operations, our tactics, our training, uh, we've yet to fully uh, embrace the central role of both EM and cyber uh, in all of that spectrum. In other words, we, ha we, have, a, we have work to do. We recognize that. It's to, we, we recognize we have this work to do. And how we command and control it, do we treat it, and, and how we treat it, is it an individual entity or is it a part of war fighting, a central part of war fighting? I believe it, it is that. Uh, and, and so this education, it, it's got to start at the ground level uh, where we didn't, we didn't grow up with it in our DNA. Uh, right now we're establishing at the Naval Academy a cyber center. Uh, we recognize that you've got to start right from the ground floor with this, and, and it's got to be the, uh, it's got to be inculcated into the warfighter from day one. So uh, there's work to be done here, uh, no doubt. Uh, and it's not just about figuring out what form to have the discussion in, uh, but we've got to have the discussion to be able to iron out those things that I just talked about. Sure. And, and we, if I could, just we, we've got to get at this. I mean, we, because it's, it's like. In the artillery, we call it an in-flight projectile mechanic, or or build the airplane as you fly it. I mean, cy cyber is going. It's <laughs> it's going. We've got to figure this thing out, and we've got to do it pretty quick. Let me let me just make a comment from a Coast Guard perspective. So this is again the nature of the Coast Guard and, and our various different roles. Not only do we have a foot in the camp here as a as a military member and defending our networks or potentially exploiting and, and doing different types of work, we have a whole regulated industry that is relying more and more on network communication system, navigation systems, dynamic positioning systems for offshore oil rigs, all those things have potential uh, cyber vulnerabilities. So we have a whole regulated industry we're going to have to get our, who's trying to get their arms around how they're going to uh, be able to continue their operations in, in an increasingly hostile uh, cyber environment. And I echo the same thing. We're building this plane as, as we're flying. I mean, it's already in my wheelhouse, and we got to get ahead of this thing. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. Steve Cohen. Thanks, Peter. My name is Steve Cohen. I, I come from a place very far away from uh, the Beltway, which is New York City. Uh, I'm a small town lawyer, but in my spare time, I write op-eds for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And Pete Daly gave me my lead today when he said a year ago we had the capability of deploying five carrier groups. Today it's three, and a year from now it's going to be two. That was the lead paragraph. Will each of you gentlemen please give me the next three paragraphs? How do we, <laughs> how do we get the nation's attention to being under-resourced? How do we make, bring this alive? Hmm. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll take the first stab at it. I haven't really given a, a thought to a specific headline. Maybe, maybe I can follow up with you afterwards. but. Uh, as I described before, at least from a Coast Guard perspective, we are absolutely vital to the functioning of this country. We provide border security, basic sovereignty functions. We operate with our military partners. We are absolutely essential to the movement of 90% of the consumer goods which go by water. We are absolutely going to be in charge of, if this kind of country becomes an energy exporter, with the exception of stuff going to Mexico or to Canada, it's all moving by water. And all of that relies on your United States Coast Guard who provides public oversight to that entire marine industry that relies on our river systems, our nation's ports, et cetera, et cetera. There's a reason we've been around since 1790. It's because we've got a darn good brand and we deliver value for the American public. We're, regrettably, we're routinely under-resourced. Tell me what you can't do, Admiral. That's the, that's the real question. I'll give you an example. When I was JADF South Director, three quarters of the intelligence cases where we had high confidence intelligence, cocaine was moving on the water, and probably the only time to interdict that, we watched those go by because we didn't have any ships in order to go out and take care of the business. And that cocaine was headed to, to Honduras, which, if you're not aware, is the most violent country on the face of the earth. It's got a murder rate of over 90 per 100,000. It's five per 100,000 in the United States. If you're a Honduran boy born today, there's a one out of nine chance you're going to be murdered before you're the age of 20 years old. And that's because we have a cocaine demand in this country. And without ships to provide the nation's front line of defense, those transnational criminal organizations are able to impact not only the countries in Central America, but American citizens on a daily basis. That's as raw as it gets. Let me start then, and, and uh, it, 
Uh, first, I'm not a procurement guy, so uh, maybe I'll just talk to you operationally because uh, Peter said I seem to know something about that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that that's true, but uh, uh, looming in front of us is the Budget Control Act. And what that's so no matter what budget gets submitted, uh, will we be reduced to the level of the Budget Control Act? So let's talk about it in that context because it gives us a le little bit of a frame of reference. Uh, if that Budget Control Act gets implemented, uh, you know, it'll eventually lead to a Navy, uh, depending on how it's implemented, actually, and depending on how that takes place, uh, it, especially if it's in this way now of continuing resolutions, and, and in other words, where you can't dutifully plan and get ahead of what's coming. Uh, because of the impacts of the resources that have already been taken away that Admiral Daly talked to, uh, we'll end up leading to a Navy that likely will have uh, be too small and lack the advanced capabilities uh, to execute the missions that I was talking about before. You know, I, I gave some examples of where it matters, when it matters that we were there. Uh, we will still try to keep the best we have forward, and we'll do that for as long as we can. The Marine Corps is the exact same way. Uh, we're going to keep what we have forward, but eventually, uh, because uh, if if the levels stay low enough of funding we'll have gaps start to open in our ability to provide that presence where it matters, when it matters. When called on, it may take longer for us to get there. Uh, and in some cases, the forces won't have the capabilities uh, that we were hoping that they would have for the situations that they're facing. Uh, we're still out there buying uh, capability. Uh, we're not necessarily buying all the capacity of that capability. So uh, when we put things forward, we're going to make sure it has the best we have. But then the next force to come over may not be as as well equipped, so to speak. Uh, so providing that decision space for the president that I talked about, providing him those options you're talking about, uh, we may not be the, uh, so quick to be able to get there and do that. Uh, that's not something that's going to instantly happen. We won't wake up tomorrow and see that change, if that makes any sense. So uh, you, you can't cry wolf and say that tomorrow, because of that money, all of a sudden, that's not going to be there. But it, it, that capability is degrading. Uh, right now, it's degrading. We have, uh, you know, we're, you heard about what we have. We used our surge up, what we used to have back here at home. We extended our deployments about as long as we could. Uh, and so we don't have a, something to reach back for. Uh, so when we plan our deployments, if something were to break, we're likely to have gaps in where we were hoping to have presence. And so being where it matters, when it matters, becomes, starts to become in jeopardy. But I wouldn't say it's going to instantly happen when people wake up in the morning, because we're going to continue, us in the Marine Corps, to prioritize what we put forward. But don't let that fool you, because of what we talked about behind that is a force that we were used to reaching back to and having. And that force has been pressurized. And in some cases, uh, uh, right now, we're trying to recapitalize it. And without uh, funding above the Budget Control Act, we won't be able to do that. We won't be able to build that surge back up. Is that helpful? Yep. Admiral Daly, how am I doing on time? One more question. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, my name is Phil Thomas. I'm with George Mason University. Uh, you discussed the issue of uh, <clears throat> developing a naval strategy. And my question is, how have you coordinated with the Department of Transportation on the issue of the military security fleet, cargo preference, and auxiliary civilian activities? Because there's a big debate going on here in Washington about cargo preference right now, and I think the Coast Guard bill is going through. And I would like to get your perspective on this. Oh, boy. Uh, the only reason I hesitate here, because you're, you're exactly right, and the, the Coast Guard Authorization Act contains a provision, and I really can't comment on pending legislation. All I can tell you is I, I was just talking with Chip Janikin, just came over. He and I just had lunch together the other day. I meet with Merad, and they are one of our core partners and have been for many, many years. We used to belong to the Department of Transportation, had a great working relationship with Merad, and that's continued over in our work with the Department of Homeland Security. So it's on our radar. Uh, same thing with the MSC, which you're, you're exactly right, is under vigorous debate here in Washington. You know, how much capability do we need to move products around? How much of it needs to be U.S. flag? Um, the Coast Guard, at least, believes that we need a strong U.S. flag fleet to carry about a number of different functions that are very important to this nation, including moving around sensitive military cargoes and so on and so forth. How we do that, policymakers and people who write checks uh, have to understand that. And, and obviously, an active debate. 
um, and we'll have to see how, it, see how it turns out. But I, I can assure you this, that we, Merit is one of our closest partners, and we are literally working with them on a daily basis on everything that's in the Merit portfolio, and they work on huge portions of what's in the Coast Guard portfolio. Andy, I've been ignoring you. Please go ahead. You go, go ahead with the last one. Good morning, Andy Braddock. I'm a former naval person. Uh, I think I'm going to leave the uh, Marines and the Coast Guard off the hook on this thing because it's a leadership question that's very focused on what does one do to prepare the 02, 03 grades for leadership positions, command positions. Coast Guard, I know you've got jobs for uh, commanding officers of uh, 03s and of course the uh, uh, Marine Corps uh, company commanders get it right, right up close and personal right away. <clears throat> I have to think back to Admiral Mullen, who as a, as a lieutenant ran his uh, AOG either aground or against the buoy, I'm not sure, and managed to survive. Right? Uh, one wonders if the leadership today is able to allow that to happen. First, are there any opportunities for O2s, O3s, as in my in my misspent youth, there was the MSCs and MSOs and AOGs, that sort of ship doesn't exist anymore. Is this, a, is this an issue? Does it reflect the kind of uh, currency that we're seeing of commanding officers being relieved uh, at the 05 and 06 level? Uh, Thanks very much. Okay. Sir? Uh, sure. Uh, I don't think that... Uh, uh, the numbers of commands at that level have changed. We haven't had for a long time a lot of commands at the O2 and O3 level. Uh, O4s uh, uh, for some time has been about the lowest level command of ships. We do have them in other communities, for instance, uh, you know, in, in special warfare teams and in EOD teams, uh, we, we align similar to the way the Marines do when, when we get command. Uh, but maybe I can address your question uh, in, in another way. The uh, you're asking about, uh, uh, I think you're asking about uh, when, uh, when folks get up to command, are they ready to command? Uh, and I think uh, there has to be some caution in, in, uh, in the wind and in the air about that right now. And the reason I say that is because uh, as we have reduced uh, uh, the numbers of, uh, as we have reduced like we did in 2013 and stopped and lowered the level of, uh, of operations of the forces that were back home. We did this in 2013. You know, you heard about us shutting some air wings down and reducing some time and things like that because that was the only funds we could get into. When you do that, uh, you have an impact on those folks that were out there trying to get their qualifications and do their learning. And they eventually promote up. And so as they promote up, looking back to make sure that they had actually enough sets and repetitions uh, prior to being in those command functions is very important. And we're taking a hard look at that now because of what has happened in the past. And we've got programmed in money for that now. The question is, when money starts to get taken out of your portfolio late, it generally comes out of those readiness accounts. It's not significant amount of money, but it's the only places to go, and you lose those training opportunities. So there's a worry about, uh, you know, do the aviators have enough uh, uh, in the bank flight time to have the experiences to lead in those situations. Do the ship drivers have enough at sea time doing the evolutions that you would expect them to do before they had command? And we're looking really hard at that because I don't know, uh, uh, I don't know that we have the answer to the question right now. Thank you, sir. Admiral Daly, it's back to you, sir. Okay. Well, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank our panel for uh, sharing with us this morning. You know, we put them in a tight, po a tight position, as you heard. Uh, trying to talk a little bit ahead on the strategy and what it took to get there without uh, getting ahead of their respective bosses. And I appreciate very much the fact that they came out today. And uh, I want to thank our moderator, Peter, and all our, all our uh, panel members. And I'm going to give them each a copy of one of our latest Naval Institute Press books, The Accidental Admiral. Before we break, <laughs> before we break uh, I just want to mention that uh, lunch will be served. Uh, in the main room just over to my left, and uh, we'll come back here with uh, Rep. Forbes at 1245. Thank you very much. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you. Thank you.